This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Dr. Daniel Kim, founder and CEO of Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Doug and Dr. Kim discuss his recent talk, Monero Sound Money Safe Mode at the DEF CON Monero Village, the difference between privacy and secrecy, the importance to decouple the individual from the technology, and how Monero preserves individual control, liberty, and rights. They both argue how Monero is misunderstood on only being used for nefarious purposes and how we must fight to properly define ourselves to ensure our liberty in the digital age. Monero promotes innovation, which is a core American value. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Dr. Daniel Kim, thanks for coming back on. It's been a while. Yeah, it feels like it was a previous life ago. Back uh, last conversation we had was in December before the pandemic, obviously. Things, and, are, things uh, are a lot different now. Yeah. So the talk that I had given last time I was on the show was at uh, 36 C3, of course, and that got transformed into a documentary called Monero Means Money, which has since had almost 20,000 views now, which is, I think, uh, good for something that uh, the Monero community's gotten behind. Um, and I think, you know, we need to help people. We need to get the word out uh, that there's this new project that is helping to make this form of digital scarcity available to humanity. And uh, so, as a follow-up to that, there's a new updated video which I had made in the post-pandemic time. Uh, it was my keynote at DEF CON, uh, which happened last month. And after doing uh, post-production on that myself, um, we're debuting it later today, actually, on YouTube. So uh, we're hoping that that's going to also be seen by as many eyeballs as possible to get awareness out about uh, this amazing project. Yeah, so I think I got a sneak peek at that, right? Is that what I what I was sent? Okay, yeah, yeah that, that, that's amazing. Yeah, no, uh, I highly recommend to anybody that that's finding their way to this video. We'll put that, you know, the your video in the in the uh, the show notes. It's definitely a uh, Monero one hundred and one, and I would say like a Bitcoin one hundred and one as well. I mean, you get you really get to the core of uh, what the value proposition of all this stuff really is. So how, yeah, that how, was, go ahead. Oh, yeah, that was the idea was to make, uh, yeah, the 101 sort of video. And since it was originally presented to DEF CON, I make some uh, mm -hmm. assumptions that the audience is not at a, like a zero level of technical knowledge. Obviously, you know, DEF CON is full of a lot of smart uh, people who know their way around a computer. So I don't spend too much time, uh, you know, explaining what a cryptographic hash function is. I kind of assume some things. Uh, but I think for the kind of target um, type of person that the Monero project has historically been um, kind of attractive to, it's uh, pitched at about the right level for a 101. And yeah, I think anyone who watches that video and really kind of internalizes what's what's in there, I think will you know be in a pretty good position to have uh, meaningful conversations, for example, in the Monero subreddit, which is a place where a lot of discussion happens. Um, and I would even say, yeah, that if you're new to Bitcoin and you watch this, you would also be above average, I would say, in, in technical knowledge. Well, uh, as I'm sure you know, I'm, I'm running for US Congress. I'm sure that that's gotten to you uh, at some point. Um, so I'm going to take this video because I haven't really spoken too vocally about crypto to my my general constituency so obviously mm -hmm. to the crypto people I, I let them know you know that i'm uh you know i'm i'm, I'm the monero candidate 
Uh, but I'm going to take this video. I'm going to post it on my on my Facebook to the the general uh, constituency as a way to uh, explain uh, Bitcoin and Monero to everyone. So looking forward to that. That's great. Um, yeah, no. So I mean, obviously, it's I, as you already know. We know we, we know each other. Uh, you know, it's a it's a big part of kind of my belief system. You know, I, I see Monero as you know the technology that we need to preserve di uh, you know liberty in the digital age is how I describe it. And then, obviously, with not knowing what that means, it, it then takes a lot of uh, uh, you know explanation to to get people to understand why that means that you know. Um, uh, you know, understanding the true censorship resistant nature of Monero. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a core, it's, it's one of the reasons actually, you know, why I got motivated to run for Congress. Cause I, I think it's one of the assaults that we're currently under in terms of our liberties in this, in this country and, and in the world, uh, as you know, we enter this digital age and, you know, I think people are becoming a lot more aware of it, right. That there's, there's these behemoths that are basically controlling all our information, whether they be corporations or governments. Uh, and we need a way of preserving our liberty as we enter this digital age. And I think crypto and in particular Monero is, is very well suited to do that in terms of money. And I also see it in terms of raw communication. Uh, I, I often describe Monero as a, as a communication protocol and tool, not just a way of transacting value, but it's a way of transacting information and it's a way of, of doing it where uh, it truly can't be censored. Mm. But um, yeah, I think it's great that you're taking this initiative to uh, run for your the fourth district of New York. Uh, and um, I just as you know, I didn't ask anyone for permission to start speaking at conferences about Monero uh, as it's part of the ethos of the project that if there's something you don't like about it or, or you think that could be done better by the community, it's really up to you to, you know, volunteer and step up to the plate and give it your best shot. And so, um, yeah, I think what you're doing is, you know, consistent with that ethos of, um, you know, taking a stand for what you feel are principled ideas that are important to say, uh, perhaps despite the um, strength of the opposition against you, but uh, it is, it's a great uh, thing. And I, and I hope more people undertake that. I think that in Monero, especially because it tends to be, uh, well, it tends to attract people who are basically introverted, I would say. Definitely. Like if you, if you look at the type of person who is just more inclined to keep a quiet life uh, it's, and, and not get on Twitter and argue all day. Um, it's probably uh, that sort of um, mindset, just the person who feels that they, their business is their business and they don't want to put their noses in other people's business and they would prefer that other people didn't put their noses in their business. So um, the, the downside to that is that there could be sort of a like a tragedy of the commons in which um, only a small number of people feel compelled to speak out publicly. Um, while mm -hmm. the people who don't speak out publicly just kind of enjoy the benefits of the project without necessarily staking anything. And, and the, the difficulty, the problem with this is that the narrative surrounding Monero uh, could increasingly be turned in a direction that is not favorable because mm -hmm. it's, for, for example, uh, focused on only the negative consequences of having a fungible money. So I think it's really important mm -hmm. for, and, and I say this in the uh, video that's premiering today, for, you know, oh, for squeaky yeah. people, like squeaky clean people to be uh, making an effort to mm -hmm. kind of support this project. Yeah, I mean, you really get at the heart of uh, um, what drove me to essentially take that step forward. Uh, I see, I see it the exact same way. I mean, I was very much a, a, just a lurker in the crypto community, um, which I think is, is the, is the, the true nature of most true crypto people. Um, uh, you know, I was there to just kind of, kind of learn, but you know, 
if you're if you're gonna own uh you know a privacy centric cryptocurrency you're probably not the type of person that's going to be out there uh wanting to tell everybody that you own this money um but for me i'm i'm more interested in um the idealism behind it and so much so that i'm willing to kind of sacrifice part of its own value to just to go out there and make sure that it does exist and it works and it gets off the ground and realizing you know that that it still it still performs its function uh even even if you become a public person and let everybody know that you own it which i think is an important thing too you're i'm trying to starting to showcase that right uh so you know you, you can own your your monero and let everybody know it uh and and that's that's okay um sure so, there, yeah, it was there a, is a it, distinction between privacy and secrecy right so people often confuse the two right so Privacy simply means that the user is control of who sees the data. Um, and the user just has some semblance of, you know, control in this new era in which, uh, you know, copying of digital information and permanent storage of digital information is now a thing. So, you know, for the individual to have the right to be able to choose who it is and when it is that they want to choose to disclose you know, information about themselves, that's a valuable thing. And it it is a mistake to equate that with secrecy or the desire to try and hide something from people. It's really about individual control and individual liberty and in, in individual rights. Yeah, and I, you know, and I see that the biggest threat to Monero, uh, or at least one that I could help out with is is this you know smear campaign against it uh and this misunderstanding that it's you know just used for nefarious purposes um so i think it's important for somebody like me to step out there um you know running for elected office last thing i want to do is be associated with something nefarious so i'm trying to prove that through example and through conversations you know uh describing you know I often equate it to the internet itself, you know, so the internet obviously is used for, for good things and bad things. But I think uh, overall, most people would say we want to keep the internet. Uh, and it's important that, you know, we have governments around the world that help preserve that technology um, because it's, it's going to lead to good things. So, you know, that, that, that's just another reason why uh, I wanted to, to bring it to the forefront. Um, is just to kind of start to fight that battle. Uh, I didn't want, you know, Monero to just be sitting there and being, you know, uh, misdefined. Unfortunately, we have to step out and and define it properly, define it for ourselves. Otherwise, it's gonna. I think ultimately it would still succeed, but I think this just helps it uh, hopefully succeed faster and in a in a more positive way. I mean, there's just so so many positive things about this technology and it's so easy to, to just brush it aside and uh you know say uh just point out the you know the the negatives uh even with my campaign i recently I'm, i've been attacked somebody created a fake website and it's like you know doug tuman uh supports isis because he owns monero which is just an absurd statement uh, like i said it might as well be you know doug tuman supports internet technology, you know, therefore he supports, you know, uh, terrorist groups that use the internet. I mean, I see it as as absurd as that. Um, but, you know, I think it's important for that reason. And I think for the the reason of, you know, the the the, the cypherpunk or, you know, um, I uh, ideals are that, you know, they're 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 not relying on governments, right? It's it's, it's about relying on code and math to to kind of uh, pave the new way. Uh, and I very much um, admire that. And I think ultimately that will that will work. Um, but, you know, governments exist and they're going to exist for a very long time. Uh, and uh, governments as, as we know them today. And, you know, politics is not going anywhere. So to just kind of tunnel in from the other side, uh, you know, helping uh, Monero and cryptos get adopted in a positive light. So rather than just relying on the technology to kind of do its thing, um, also, you know, 
using politics to make it more acceptable because it should be acceptable. Uh, you know, I've mm. even gone so far as to kind of start to describing it as, you know, the, the new America, right? This transition, right, to, to the digital age now as we're all moving to the internet and that here's, here's the, 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 the new protocol that's going to ensure our liberty in, in the digital age. And so uh, that's, why, that's why I'm doing this and that's why, that's why I think it, it needs to be done. Sure. Um, also, as far as, uh, you know, that, that uh, smearing website goes, um, there's always been a healthy recognition in America that the technology needs to be separated from the individual's actions. In other words, criminality is an individual thing. It, it requires individual intent and the technology is separate from that. So, um, you know, for example, if fast cars come out, like let's say, you know, if we look at Tesla making cars that can accelerate a crazy amount uh, compared to gasoline engine cars. Um, you know, you could make the argument that, well, you know, bank robbers are going to use that to, to get away uh, quicker. And so the, you know, that kind of sloppiness of thinking leads to this association of fast cars with criminality. Whereas again, it's, it's an individual thing. It's, you have individuals who have squeaky clean uh, legal records and have no ill intent, which is actually, I would say the vast majority of Americans, and you have the small minority who are not. And so it's important to decouple the individuals from the technology. And, and so that is really what Monero does in being fungible. In other words, it separates the users of the network from each other so that you don't have this situation like in Bitcoin where reputation transfers as well as value which uh, I think for someone who has a, uh, has worked, you know, hard in their life to maintain a solid reputation is, is a concern that, um, you know, individuals can only control their own behavior. They can't control the behavior of other people who happen to use the same network, right? And so to, to potentially penalize a user of the network because they happen to get mixed up with a kind of a, you know, less uh, legally healthy member of the community, uh, which does not necessarily mean that they actually had a uh, a link with them. For example, in the in the uh, talk that's going um, on premiere today, I talk about the example of selling a used car to somebody, uh, and unbeknownst to you, the person who gives you Bitcoin in exchange for your used car got it through some kind of illicit mm -hmm. means, and so. Now the people doing blockchain analysis see that a known quote unquote bad person has given you, you know, $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, right? That's all they see is they see that a bad person gave you $10,000 worth of Bitcoin. They don't see the rest of the picture, which is, which is that the actual situation behind this was a, a arm, arm's length transaction between two complete strangers right? When one person selling a car to another person through a Craigslist advertisement, right? So there, there's actually zero social link between those two people. But the problem is with a transparent coin or a surveillance coin like Bitcoin is that because the, the linkage data between people in the network is perfect, it encourages uh, another sloppiness of thinking to think that any two people who are transacting value on this network are necessarily in cahoots. They're they're on the same team. They're on the same. They're doing the same, uh, uh, you know, either legitimate or illegitimate thing as uh, that's going on behind that transaction. And so, yeah, again, the decoupling of individual intent with technology is an important legal concept, and it's been true in America, and I hope it continues to be true. Uh, and Monero simply puts in technological reinforcement to that whole principle. Yeah, no, I think it's very much an American value because it, it obviously it promotes innovation, right? You, you need that value to exist for, for uh, you know, innovation to, to happen. Um, 
Yeah, and there's another point on that, and and that is, you know, the competitiveness of American kind of industry going forward. Uh, and it's been kind of outlined by the pandemic. You know, do do Americans actually make anything anymore that the world actually wants? It's it's uh, an open question because so much of the productive capacity has been moved overseas due to, um, you know, a number of factors. But you know, it is what it is, uh, and. To the extent that Nakamoto consensus has ushered in the potential of a, a new financial industry, uh, it could be chased away to other countries if the U.S. has maybe you know kind of short-sighted um, people in charge of making the laws. Yes, that that's the last point I wanted to make. You know, if uh, if you had if you had to make an argument, you know, on the floor of Congress as as to why it's it's so vital for us to allow these technologies to flourish, I think that's probably the most important point you can make. Uh, I mean, the U.S. had a laissez-faire approach to internet regulation when that happened in the dot-com bubble years. Um, there were some debates, for example, about encryption and the clipper chip and so on. You remember back in the uh, in the Clinton years, but um, for the most part, freedom kind of won that debate. Uh, the idea that hey, let's let's take our hands off, let's not kind of strangle this burgeoning new industry with a whole bunch of laws and regulations that are going to simply drive innovation overseas. Let's let's just you know grit our teeth at some of the negative uh, things that are happening on the internet. Because in the early days, you would see sensational news stories about all the awful, rotten things that were happening on the internet, uh, and you know, just uh, wait and see before getting too ham-fisted with regulation. And as a result of that, that is why we now use Google and Amazon instead of, you know, WeChat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and those companies were given protection through through case law. Um, you know, essentially protecting the platform saying, you know, it's for, in, 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 you know, for the most part, right. The, these, these platforms were, were protected and, and incubated and saying, you know, it's, it's, it's about the users, you know, if the users are, are, are there and doing, you know, nefarious things or committing crimes, uh, those are the ones to blame, not the platform, not the technology. Uh, and, you know, that's what allowed the, those companies to flourish. Um, otherwise, you could imagine, you know, we, we could have very easily, you know, shut down uh, a lot of these companies in the early in the early days for for illegal activity happening on them. Um, but let's let's jump into your talk. So you start off with uh, talking about the uh, pandemic economy, um, and. Uh, so, so how, how do you feel about that? I mean, obviously, you know, so that talk about something that air, all eyeballs are on globally. I mean, you know, it's not sure. often that we have a global event where everybody is aware of it and, and, and tuning into it. Um, do you think it brought or is bringing or will bring attention to this fact that, you know, Governments are, are often creating money out of thin air because we, we've we've seen it now because of that. We've seen it in, obviously in many other instances throughout history, but now it was done in such a large way, uh, you know, where we we created you know essentially trillions of of, of dollars out of thin air. Um, do you think that might be one of the effects? And will that kind of uh, is that was that a moment in, in crypto's history where there'll become more of this realization that wait a minute, uh, you know this this whole fiat thing there there might be some issues there. We we need sound money uh, and maybe maybe crypto can fill. Yeah, that. I, I think probably at this point in the pandemic crisis is maybe the time where people can stop and have some time to realize that um, it might be worth their while to take on the initial cost of investing time and effort into understanding this, how this form of new digital scarcity works. Uh, because I think in the initial reaction to the pandemic, people tend to cling to what they know. That's like, when there's an emergency, that's not really the time to be 
delving into educational materials and learning about something totally new. Uh, and so um, I think there's a reaction to go to things that you already know. So for example, uh, you know, for people who are concerned about uh, monetary expansion, there's like the rush to gold uh, as a store of value. But, you know, as this pandemic drags on, I think now is about the right time for people to be thinking about um, actually taking the time to sit down and understand how the Nakamoto white paper works and understand that this is a genuine innovation uh, in history. It's not a it's not a scam. It's not a um, there. There is actually intellectual rigor in this introduction of decentralized scarcity that the Nakamoto white paper puts forth. And so, yeah, I think now is probably the time when you're going to see more people sitting down and doing this because uh, when I mentioned the fixed costs of uh, education. So for example, somebody who decides that they want to uh, have some gold in their portfolio, there's a learning curve with that. Like you would think that it's just a simple thing. You just call up a dealer and buy some gold. But if you really want to do it right, you, you first of all, you would own self-custody of your gold or silver, right? And so you have to do some research and how are you going to store it? How are you, what are you going to do? Uh, and then I think in precious metals, fakes are the big thing to worry about. So um, how do you know that the shiny metal that, that you just bought is actually what you paid for and not something much cheaper that's been dressed up to look like what you think you bought? And so to get into that, there's like a bunch of stuff you got to do. You got to learn about the properties of the metal that you bought, physical properties, and you have to maybe invest in some testing equipment to make sure that the you know, electrical conductivity uh, is what you think it is. And even if you do a bunch of these tests, you know that they're going to be probably sophisticated people who know that you are doing those tests and have put in some thought and effort into faking you out too. And so it, it becomes this rabbit hole, I think, of really, really understanding how to do self-custody self in a proper in manner. manner. So uh, in cryptocurrency, there's a similar level of initial investment that needs to happen in order to properly hold. And when I say properly hold, I mean, take self custody of cryptocurrency. And so on the surface, it's much more difficult than in gold. Uh, but at the heart of it, as I explained in my video, it's about keeping a number secret. That is what self custody means in the cryptocurrency era is that you pick a number out of this vast field of possibilities of numbers. So we're talking, you know, a 78 digit number of possibilities. And then you keep that number, that is your private key or in Monero, that would be your mnemonic seed, the 25 word uh, sequence that basically holds the key to the Monero that is owned by an address. That is what needs to be kept secret. So um, and unlike the situation in precious metals, where I think the primary difficulty is probably in figuring out how to make sure that you don't get a fake in cryptocurrency, uh, within a currency, it's easy to know whether something is fake or not, right? So we don't worry about fake Monero being out there because that is cryptographically secured. Um, it's, it's trivial to, to know, uh, if a given Monero address is, for example, legitimate or not. Um, and so, you know, if it's illegitimate, it won't be able to spend money is the bottom line. And no amount of, you know, fakery or window dressing is going to change that. In cryptocurrency, the main difficulty in distinguishing fakes is basically the thousands of projects that are out there. So that is the chief difficulty in cryptocurrency now that we're in an age of this industry in which there's not just one project out there to know about, there's potentially thousands. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, all, all great points. Do you, do you want to um, maybe show some of your slides? Um, right. I think, you know, it's very impactful, uh, you know, even the initial money supply slides 
um, that start to, uh, you know, depict, um, you know, where we were and where we are now in terms of money supply. Sure. Yeah. Here's one that um, you as a potential congressman would certainly be interested in. And, um, you know, whoever ends up coming out on top on the coming election is going to have to deal with this mess that we're seeing here. Um, what I'm showing here is a plot showing 40 years of history. And this is all US government data taken from the St. Louis Federal Reserve, uh, their data repository called FRED, which is quite useful for data geeks. And so, you know, going back to um, the election, the initial election of Ronald Reagan to the present time. Um, so first I'm showing us several lines here. So just first in blue is U6 unemployment. So that is the expansive measure of unemployment, which counts not only people who are actively looking for work, but also people who are so discouraged by their job search that they quit looking. And also people who are underemployed. So for example, part-time workers who really want to be working full-time, that also gets counted in U6. So uh, you can see that. And so for you know the unemployment, we're using the left scale here. You can see that it peaked in, 2020, a few months ago at about uh, 23%, which is the highest rate it ever was in the history of this statistic. And so the reaction to that uh, by the government is concern of price deflation, because when people lose their jobs en masse like that, then obviously there's less spending ability within the economy. And if people stop spending, then you could lead to a situation where kind of the wheels of commerce stop moving. And so the reaction to that was to print more money because printing more money lowers the interest rate. So that's kind of macroeconomics 101 with the ISLM curves. So basically it shifts the, um, the curve down so that the intersecting point uh, on the interest rate axis goes down. So basically money creation causes the interest rate to go down. When the interest rate goes down, then it becomes less attractive to save your money in a bank account because you're just getting a piddly amount of interest on it. It's more attractive to spend that money rather than to save it. And so that's the idea is that the expansion of the money supply is going to counter a deflationary tendency. But you can see here now in the green line, which is the MZM money supply, which is the money zero maturity uh, measure of money supply, which counts M1 plus savings accounts, plus money market accounts. So uh, again, going back to the Reagan years, you see that there's this uh, kind of steady rise up. And then once 2000 happened, there's this uh, spike here in the money printing. So yeah, so that's one ingredient. That's the fiscal side of things, which is controlled by the Federal Reserve, which is supposed to be a politically independent body that is supposed to be you know, imposing wise discipline on the economy. That is why the Fed was created as a nonpartisan, it's created outside of the basically partisan system, is that it was supposed to be able to be um, taking kind of potentially pop unpopular decisions that were nevertheless necessary for long-term, um, like, uh, you know, wise stewardship of the economy. Um, but on the fiscal side, nevertheless, we see this unprecedented level of money printing. Uh, then on the fiscal side, which is what Congress controls, which is the passing of the budget and the collecting of taxes and the spending of the government revenue that comes in from taxes, that is this gray line down here, which you can see uh, spikes up and down four times a year because that's when estimated taxes are due, right? And you can see, for example, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, there were a few years in which the amount of taxes coming in did not cover the amount of government expenses going out. So that's why you see this gray line looks somewhat negative here. When that happens, um, just like a family that has a credit card, uh, if you don't send the credit card company enough money to, you know, to cover your expenses, then that's going to end up increasing your uh, the, the balance on your credit card that you carry from month to month. And the equivalent of that in the governmental level is the federal debt. Here I'm normalizing that to GDP, but you can see in the um, aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, this 
seemingly small uh, shortfall in taxes collected resulted in this expansion of the uh, federal debt to GDP. Right? Now we come to 2020 and, uh, you know, it's kind of scary to see this. Like, uh, like, I actually found myself kind of feeling worried for the IRS. Who actually does that? You know, uh, because <laughs> the, um, it, it is terrifying when you look at it. Right. Uh, the April 15 tax deadline in the U.S. got postponed to July 15. Um, but the government spending continued. You know, it's, it's not that government spending stopped when the tax revenue stopped coming in. It kept going. And it was financed by this money printing up here. But you can see that the you know taxes minus spending took this historic uh, dip into deficit spending. Um, and at the time that I made this chart, uh, this was going through uh, June, so the July data point was not yet out, right? And so now, um, and I said in the talk that um, it remains to be seen if the IRS had a bonanza in July, because if the postponement of the tax deadline to July simply deferred that incoming tax revenue to July, then what you would see is a corresponding spike in the positive side when July came because, right, so the, it would have been a temporary uh, delay from the government's point of view of incoming tax revenue. And so you would see in July a point that was somewhere way up here, one would hope. But the July number came out uh, subsequent to my talk happening, and it's actually still negative. So in this month, which um, was kind of the due date for estimated taxes for the entire first half of the year, which was July 15, they still couldn't make the budget work. And so it seems likely that this um, downward spike is going to not be offset by a, a positive spike in the opposite direction. And so now you can kind of um, extrapolate what's going to happen to the federal debt now that we've had these several month period with this very large shortfall in, in terms of government tax revenue. So regardless of who uh, wins in the November elections, um, you know, they're going to have to deal with this. And there was an um, interesting book that was uh, mentioned in my talk also called Monetary Regimes and Inflation that did a study of 29 historical cases of hyperinflation and found that in 25 out of 29 of those cases, the root cause was money creation financing government debt. So going back, we've got the money creation and we've got the debt. So uh, I said in my talk also that it's not a foregone conclusion that higher inflation is going to result from this. Uh, but this certainly doesn't help the prospects. And I think for anyone with assets to save, it behooves them, I think, to take some time and look into alternate forms of scarcity. So, you know, obviously, you, you and I uh, see the value in something like Monero as being a safe haven um from from this right um how do you see it working in the future if if you know if a lot of others start to start start to also uh see the value in this uh you know and people uh inevitably move over to to this more sound money um what what is what is the future gonna look what do you see the future looking like for let's say a, you know a government like america um, that, you know, obviously traditionally fiat based, if more and more people start storing their wealth in crypto and using crypto for these reasons, what, what do you, what does the future look like, uh, for governments and, uh, how they, uh, basically, you know, traditionally have turned the dials, allowing them to navigate these times, right? So the, the money printing, um, allowed us uh you know can be argued was you know was it was a tool that allowed us to 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 navigate these these times how is that going to play out in the future what's how do you see crypto working into that well, well I, guess I guess i 
can't really prescribe any fantastic ideas for the politicians to come up with um, you know, appropriate revenue schemes for the age that they live in. But I will say it is an evolutionary kind of problem, right? So um, I guess through the ages, governments have had to deal with the technology that existed in the day and find some way to come up with a, you know, some sort of fair taxation system to generate revenue. Uh, I, I, um, I'm not one of these people who thinks that, you know, cryptocurrency is going to revolutionize everything and we're going to, you know, fiat's not going to exist and, and so on. I, I don't think such a, um, hypothesis or is necessarily even helpful. Um, these money is really a tool. It's, it's a method of communication. And, uh, I think, well, I think first gratitude is probably in order that since 2009, there actually has been a viable alternative to scarcity than something that is kind of told to you as scarcity by the government that you happen to have been born under. So first of all, there's gratitude there. I think that, you know, it's, it's great to be living in a time where this is actually an option. Um, but again, because it's somewhat difficult to get one's head around how this stuff works, and because there is so much uh, noise, there's just so such a, a degree of charlatans and snake oil around this technology, just because the, you know, it is confusing to understand at first, and it is easy to simply parrot buzzwords from cryptocurrency and kind of make a word salad that kind of tries to, you know, make something impressive sounding to other people. It is like the dot-com bubble in which, um, you know, the... Uh, prospect of the internet coming was really hyped up. And um, while there were genuine, you know, innovation, there was genuine innovation behind that. And eventually there, not, there were companies that um, made good use of bringing the power of the internet and making it useful and affordable to people. That eventually happened. But in the early days, that wasn't the case. There were all sorts of stupid ideas that uh, got combined with internet buzzwords to make a, you know, sexy company like pets.com, which would send, you know, FedEx 50 pound bags of dog food to people, uh, but they use the internet to take their orders. And because of that, it was valued as a, you know, as a big company back in the day. And so we have the exact same thing happening now. So I think, you know, one thing that we have to get past uh, in getting people to understand what this innovation is, is education. So in some small way, I'm trying to help, you know, bring that understanding to people by trying to explain things in a way that's easy to understand and comprehend, not getting too technical. Um, but about the uh, scarcity aspects, there's another chart in the talk that maybe I'll bring up. Um, so this is kind of uh, a corollary of the chart that I showed before. So this is now year over year supply inflation. This is asking the question, how much of a scarce good was there today versus the same day a year ago? And if you look at the green line, that's the US dollars, the MZM, the money zero maturity measure of the money supply. And you can see that it took this uh, just unprecedented uh, spike up in the pandemic starting in 2020. Uh, in contrast to that, here you have the, you know, classic um, uh, source of scarcity that is not government controlled, and that is gold. But of course, even gold gets dug out of the ground, and so it, it actually inflates. Uh, and it's been inflating at a pretty constant rate of about 1.8% per year for the last decade. So these are numbers from the World Gold Council, which makes an estimate of the world's above ground gold stocks. So if you use this as a kind of working definition of sound money, that is a source of independent scarcity that inflates by 1.8% per year or less, then you can see that um, right now, Bitcoin and Monero are still inflating maybe by a bit more. We're at like the three to 4% level if you look at year over year supply inflation. Uh, but pretty soon, like in a matter of months, uh, it's going to become a situation in which both Bitcoin and Monero are inflating by less than the amount that gold is inflating. Um, and so, you know, to your original question, what happens if, uh, you know, everybody, you know, 
gets wise to this and starts looking at these alternative forms of scarcity. Well, first of all, I don't, I, I don't think that's that, that's realistic. I mean, it's it's always been sort of a niche of people who are, I'd say, um, well, it's like there are two dimensions, right? You need there's there's technical expertise, and then there's sort of, I don't know, I don't know how else to say it, but like emotional maturity, like investing maturity. And then there's a third axis, I would say, which is openness to something that's new. And and so if you look on that kind of three-dimensional space, the kind of the ideal crypto investor who has everything has not only you know sufficiently deep technical knowledge of what's actually going on, but also you know some experience with traditional capital markets and some demonstrated you know maturity in in understanding how the world works in in terms of the legacy finance system not just coming in and saying you know legacy finance is all irrelevant here we have this new thing look at us but rather looking at this new technology in context of current um, markets and then lastly is this capability to uh, to be open to something that is out of left field and to have the confidence well there's there are a few aspects to that is that it's one thing to be open to new ideas, but you don't want to be so open to new ideas that you become a sucker and fall for something that's fraudulent, right? And so I think the fear of that uh, is often behind a kind of rejection of everything that is coming out of left field, right? So anyway, that that is all going to say that I'm a bit skeptical that there could be, you know, truly mass adoption where every every person on the planet's using crypto. No, it's, you know, maybe there could be a time in the future, but it seems very far from now. I think more likely is that there's going to be, continue to be a, uh, basically a trickle of people who, who are able to, you know, see these issues in, and understand the technology, have the open-mindedness also the confidence to know that they are not falling for a scheme. And all of that comes from an increased level of technical knowledge too. So yeah, I think it's gonna be uh, just organic gradual adoption and not not really like a, a single moment where everyone decides to rush in. I mean, I guess, of course, if there were a sort of hyperinflation sort of scenario that could all go out the window because in a, in a true hyperinflation sort of scenario, you know, like for example, the prices of things are changing within the day, right? The price of a loaf of bread in the morning is different than the price of a loaf of bread in the afternoon. That's, that's kind of historically what true hyperinflation has looked like. It might be a totally different story, you know, if there's actual hyperinflation, but assuming that the Fed and, you know, the combination of monetary and fiscal policy are able to get through this crisis without inducing a hyperinflation um, episode. Assuming that they're successful in doing that, it seems that there's just going to be continuing organic adoption of these um, alternate forms of scarcity, in which case um, probably there would be time for governments to react and look into you know, alternate systems of taxation to account for that. And of course, there's nothing to say that crypto is incompatible with current taxation. I mean, the, um, anyone who is quote unquote squeaky clean as, and is in crypto is doing everything the IRS says we're supposed to do with crypto, which is report every single disposition of crypto as a capital gain event. Um, you report that whether, you not, whether or not you get a 1099 on, on that um, disposition of the asset, you take it upon yourself to report your gains and um, put them on your Schedule D and pay what to do on them. So there's nothing incompatible about um, cryptocurrency with current tax law. Again, it's up to the individual. It's an individual level um, question. Like the technology is there, what individuals choose to do with it is an individual thing. And it's not, it's not the fault of the technology, what individuals choose. Maybe we could, uh, we could jump ahead to, well, actually I want one, one of the points you brought up was, uh, statements you made 
was the knowledge of the private key is a form of speech. If you just elaborate on, on, on what you meant by that, I thought that was an interesting uh, statement. Yeah, so because of the way the Nakamoto, Nakamoto consensus introduces the concept of property rights, which is what is the analog of a bank account in cryptocurrency? And as I mentioned before, it is picking a number in, or more specifically, it's picking a point on an elliptic curve of which there are an unimaginably large number of, right? And so it's kind of like, uh, you know, imagine that, you know, you have the earth being made of grains of sand or actually much smaller than that. So this anal any analogy you try to come up with comes up short. For example, if you were to say that, imagine that the earth were made of uh, grains of sand and picking a Bitcoin account or Monero account for that matter is analogous to picking one of those grains of sand up and calling it yours. Um, kind of never mind the difficulty of picking a grain of sand that's gonna be in the earth's core, right? Not just on the earth's surface. But even if you use an analogy like that, the number of grains on an earth-sized object is just far, far short of the number of cryptocurrency ad addresses out there. So I think it just goes to show that there's this uh, unimaginably large number of addresses that can be picked. But once a person picks that and is the only person uh, on earth with knowledge of that, then that is what constitutes ownership. Because knowledge of which elliptic curve point that is, is the private key that allows the spending of whatever money is associated with that private, uh, the public key. And so therefore knowledge of that private key uh, is in itself uh, cash. So there's this interesting situation where um, knowledge of a fact, which you can consider to be speech, is now in itself a form of money. And so whether or not, you know, the degree to constitutional protections that we are afforded as a result of that fact is maybe up in question, but certainly it is a interesting way to look at the uh, situation in that knowledge of a fact is now tantamount to money itself. And so there are First Amendment, I think, uh, implications to that. I'm getting, I'm getting hammered by leaf blowers over here. I mm -hmm. apologize for that. Um, give, me, give me one second. All right, sorry about that. We'll edit that out. Um, if you want, we could uh, we can jump ahead to just talking about the you know the the differences between Bitcoin and Monero. Um, I think you you boil it down pretty well. Um, we don't have to go through everything. I think once again, anybody who's who's viewing this, uh, you definitely have to watch Daniel's full talk. Um, to get all the details. Um, but is there anything specifically that you, you want to talk about there that, 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 jump, that really jumps out, you know, differences between Bitcoin and Monero? I mean, a lot of people that are going to be watching this video, like I said, I'm going to put this on my Facebook page. This is kind of their, for some of them, kind of their, their first deep dive into crypto. Um, what, how would you briefly describe uh, the difference between Bitcoin and Monero? Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess for, somebody for somebody who's, who's completely, completely new, new to, to the this space, space and, and wants, wants a, a quick understanding, understanding of the difference between the two, imagine that uh, $10 bills had this feature that if you flipped over your $10 bill and looked at the back of it, it had your personal bank account number etched into it. 
And not only did it have your personal bank account etched into it, it had the bank account number of the person who gave you that $10 bill, basically the owner who had it before you. And imagine that it also had not only your bank account and the last person's bank account, but a complete history of every individual who owned that $10 bill going all the way back to the US Mint. That's Bitcoin. And it is completely uh, different than what is portrayed about Bitcoin in the popular press. Uh, nobody expects to, to um, have this situation which offers actually worse privacy than your fiat bank. At least with your fiat bank, the people who have access to your records um, are limited to bank employees and, and people uh, who kind of need a demonstrated uh, reason to be looking into your bank account records. In Bitcoin, there's no such thing. Anyone in the world can look at any $10 bill, the equivalent of any $10 bill, and do this exercise of typing in a address to a blockchain explorer and seeing not only how much money do they have, but everybody in the past who they've transacted with. Uh, it's this um, invitation to voyeurism. And as the world moves increasingly towards a mass surveillance state, anyone who is aware of that and finds that entire idea to be disturbing or um, at least unsavory uh, needs to know that there are alternate projects uh, and Monero is number one on that list uh, as to um, forms of digital scarcity that take the core elements of what Bitcoin has done so well and improves on them by adding fungibility, which is this property that all units of the currency are like each other. In other words, the $10 bills, they don't have this thing that you can flip them over and see the complete history of them. $10 bills are just $10 bills and they look alike and you can, and um, you don't have to worry about accidentally ending up with a quote unquote bad $10 bill, which has a quote unquote bad history because a quote unquote bad person happened to own it before you did uh, due to no um, nefarious action on your part. So yeah, I guess that is the, uh, the uh, kind of big picture non-technical um, way in which Bitcoin and Monero differ. And this is, and this is also where the, the largest debate takes place kind of, I think in, in crypto right now, um, you know, and, and for, for, for outsiders that are, that are viewing crypto, all these things we said, you know, this, this fear of the technology being used in nefarious ways. So with this fungibility comes essentially this ability to, to use Monero uh, privately um, and in a way where your transactions can't be traced. And, uh, you know, some people on the surface just instantly think of all the bad things that that can lead to uh, without realizing all, all the, the, necess the necessary reasons why something like that uh, is, is yeah. People seem to jump to really wanting to know what the criminals are going to be wanting to do. Why? I don't understand. Why is that? And so basically part of my reason for doing this keynote and putting this content out there is that, you know, for once I would like to talk about what squeaky clean people would like out of a, a cryptocurrency. Nobody talks about that. And there are far more of the law abiding, you know, people than there are the criminals. I don't know why it is that there's this automatic almost, I would say, you know, there's something pathological about it, like, like this automatic jump to, oh, gee, what are the criminals going to do? Why don't we talk about what the law abiding, you know, squeaky clean people want? Let's start with that. Let's give them the good stuff. And then if criminals end up with the good stuff too, well, there's been police work, there's been old fashioned detective work that's been that's been used for all of time that happened before the introduction of decentralized um, scarcity. So again, it's a individual matter. And again, this is why, I, again, I think it's important for the narrative to be out there that squeaky clean people need fungibility. And I hope more people will join us really in, in becoming 
public voices for that. It doesn't have to be, you know, going on YouTube and making videos or whatever. It could it can be just in your private circle of people, you know, just letting them know that they're that you know this is an important thing for innocent people. Yeah, I think you you summed it up in your talk as Monero is sound money in safe mode. It's where squeaky clean people go. So yeah, if you just, if you just want to reiterate that one more time as to as to why uh, it makes sense for uh, somebody who uh, you know is squeaky clean, why they would choose Monero over something like Bitcoin because it it isn't it isn't completely obvious. I know you went into it a little bit already, but just to reiterate because it's such an important point, and I think it's hard for people to grasp because it's um, it's not something that you would naturally uh arrive upon yeah i think it's uh the base motivation for a squeaky clean person to want monero is that they don't want to be falsely accused and false accusations are something that this basically partial information system of openness in bitcoin uh promote because within the blockchain of bitcoin everything is transparent every one in the world can see who sent what to whom, when, and how much. What they don't know is the kind of identities of the people of each of the accounts, but that is, uh, that is readily solvable uh, for a large number of accounts just through the KYC AML data that gets collected, right? The other thing that's completely missing is the social context behind any given financial transaction. So for example, going back to my example of selling a car and getting Bitcoin from it, you sell your car to a complete stranger. You have no business, you have no related anything together, except for this one moment in time when you had a car and they had some Bitcoin and you made an exchange and you went on your way. But because the blockchain and Bitcoin is so radically transparent, it encourages the drawing of conclusions based on partial information, which can be wrong. And unfortunately, the end user has no recourse. They have no way of mitigating that probability of being falsely accused in that manner. Uh, it's quite disturbing because not only could it be from a arm's length transaction like uh, selling a car, but it's not only things that happened in the Bitcoin's past that could be used to falsely accuse you. It's also things that in, are in the Bitcoin's future that could be used to accuse you. Because the uh, chain analysis companies basically flatten the time dimension, instead of having a time dimension of at this time, person A transacted with um, person B, you, the, the analysis will, will tend to flatten that, take the time dimension out. So all you see is a graph. You see A being a circle, you see B being a circle, and you see a line connecting the two, right? So you take away that time dimension out. What that means is that it's not only that you have to worry about what could have been done with the Bitcoin before you had it, you also have to worry about what could be done with the Bitcoin after you've had it. So, you know, for example, if you buy a car, so if you're squeaky clean and you buy a car with Bitcoin, uh, then you're giving your Bitcoin to a stranger in exchange for receiving a car. Now, let's say that stranger goes out and does something awful, some something you know nefarious with the Bitcoin that you used to own. Well, the chain analysis companies just, again, they're ignorant of that, um, of the fact that it's a false connection that they're drawing between the two people. They just see that the two people transacted money. So because of what happened in the Bitcoin in your future, you get looked at as potentially being like an accomplice to this crime that happened with the Bitcoin after you owned it which is just as ridiculous and perhaps even more disturbing than having to worry about what happened in the Bitcoin's past. So basically the reason why squeaky clean people will, if they understand the issues, will gravitate towards a coin like Monero is that they don't want to be falsely accused. And um, you, transacting value on a network that does not expose their hard earned reputations to false accusations based on the uh, radical transparency of the underlying system is going to be something that's attractive to squeaky clean people. And it's, 
is not just a line of analysis that I came up on my own. There's, uh, in my talk, I talk about the Akerlof um, paper on asymmetric information in, in markets, which won the Nobel in economics. And so it's, you know, it's just in a good, important thing for people to understand uh, the used car market and lemons and peaches. Um, I won't rehash it here, but it's um, explained in the, in the talk. Yeah, and, and that really kind of gets at the crux of it. So yeah, once again, I encourage anybody, everybody watching this to, to watch the talk. Um, I think I think we'll leave it at that. We, co we covered a lot. We covered a lot of ground as, as usual. Um, is there anything else you want to bring up? Um, well, uh, so as you can see, I've been working on a uh, studio here. And I do plan to start making content. So my uh, consulting firm, Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, is going to start making educational content. Um, I'm hoping to be quite different from all the other crypto YouTube out there. So it's, it's there's going to be no price charts. There's going to be no talk about mooning. Uh, you know, it, there's it's going to be based on education and insight and data. Uh, and it'll be as objective and educational as I can possibly make it. So look for that in the coming weeks. That's very, consider me your, your first follower. Uh, I'll be watching every one of those. That's, that's for sure. Um, thank you, Daniel. Uh, amazing as always. Highly uh, uh, encourage you to, to, to take on that initiative. That's, that's going to be a big project. And uh, I know you'll definitely hit a home run with it. So that's awesome. That's great news. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. So where, where can people then follow you to make sure they they're, you know, they, they catch this new content as it comes out. Well, you could just search on YouTube for Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting and it should come up. Um, you know, it actually might not be the first hit, even though that name is so specific because my channel has, I think, four subscribers now. So um, yeah, if you, you know, do um, sign up for that, you will be one of the very first to be in on it. And um, yeah, beyond that, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what my production schedule is going to be, uh, Emma. I don't know if you are too. Are you? Do you do all of your post in house, or do you outsource it? In house, as you tell I me, mean, we, we don't have a very uh, you know high quality production going on over here. But we get the content out, and uh, you know I slowed down a little bit because of the run for Congress. So it's become difficult to to stay on the one show a week uh, timeline. Uh, I'm so kind of surprised you had time to do this. Bit. What's that? I'm surprised you had time to do this, actually. Yeah. So, well, I, I, I you know, I, I, this is, this is, you know, one of, one of my passions here. So I have to keep it going. Um, but yeah, no, it's been very busy, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, yeah. yeah so no, anyway, my, my advice doing... to you, though, it would be to, yeah. uh, you know, just try to be, I, I don't think you need this advice, but just try, try to be consistent, you know, try to, that the hardest part is going to be, uh, getting out there and actually posting it on a consistent basis, whether it's once a week, once a month. Uh, I think that, you know, that's, that's the, the most difficult part. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm doing all my posts too. So that's the reason for the delay and the premiere of the video today was I was spending a lot of time on it, trying to polish it and get the audio quality up and stuff like that. So. All right. And I would say just, you know, just try to get the content out there rather than trying to make it perfect. You know, more importantly, is just getting the information out there. Hmm. Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's, you, you seem yeah. like a perfectionist in many ways and it, it, it's, it's, that's tough. true, actually. It, it's, it's, it's tough to, uh, you know, without being a, a media company to, to, you know, reach that level that you may want to reach. But uh, your presentations are obviously amazing. I know you you must put a, a ton of work into those. So uh, yeah, look forward look forward to your content for sure. Great. Yeah. Likewise. Right. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm sure so we'll guess, be in touch. Yeah, maybe not till after election day. So good luck to you. Yes. Hope it goes well. All right, Daniel. Thank you. All right. Cheers. All right, bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.